Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm James Milan, and I am here for a legislative update with our state senator, Cindy Friedman. Cindy, how are Hi, you? James. Good. How are you, James? I'm doing okay. Um, I was just realizing uh, just before we went on air that this is, in fact, the third time that we're getting to talk to you. We try and talk to you every quarter, as you know. Um, and this is the third time we're talking to you under COVID because we, we snuck in right away uh, after the lockdown in March and then uh, lo and behold, six months later. So tell us a little bit, how, how are things going? How, how, how has anything changed if, if it has uh, for you in these six months? I uh, crave human direct contact um, with people other than my family who I love. Um, so I can say that's, uh, that's changed. Um, but it's kind of the new normal. Um, and I think we're all just, you know, trying to figure out how to keep going under these, uh, circumstances and, uh, but work's being done. Um, things are happening. So, uh, the world certainly hasn't stopped. Right. And is work um, being done? I mean, you, we spent a little bit of time in our other conversations just talking about how is, how are you getting the work of the state house done uh, under these circumstances? And it's been obviously a lot of Zoom meetings, just like we're doing now. Um, and some adjustments made, I think, to the processes and the, the way that you, you uh, just do the work you do. Um, but has that, has that basically, did that come into place you know, at the beginning of the of the lockdown, and and been pretty much the same, or have it, have have there been any changes of significance in just the way you're doing things uh, in the Senate? Well, I think it certainly has evolved because um, we did we done some major bills um, since I think you know since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we've done a health a big health care bill. We did an Echo Dev bill. We did a criminal justice bill. Um, Echo Dev is what? I'm sorry, economic development. I'm sorry, economic development bill. Um, and I know I'm missing something, but um, so those have taken, uh, you know, that's caused us to do business in a different way because they're much more deliberative and much more um, involved. There's lots of amendments to those bills. So there's how do you um, how do you set up a situation where a deliberative body gets to deliberate together? but they can't be together. So um, that's been a challenge and um, something that I think people have worked very hard to, to um, continue um, so that that work can get done. And then we're going longer. Uh, so usually we're done formal sessions at the end of July, at the end of two years, but that's not the case. This time we're gonna be um, continuing. We have budgets to do, we have several uh, conference committees on major bills that are working um, to get those bills done. So we'll be working further and that's, that we'll be working longer into the session and that's different. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, um, like to talk in terms of the work that you're, you know, that has been going on and is anticipated. Um, like to ask you first about any legislation that you are particularly connected to either as, you know, as a sponsor or in some other way, uh, that is, you know, has come to fruition is now is now law or or is in the process. The big area that I've been working on, of course, is healthcare, and um, we have done we did a couple of healthcare bills around scope of practice. Um, you know, scope of practice being um, allowing different kinds of providers to work to the height of their licensure. Um, and uh, I've been very involved in telehealth and also involved in um, this, uh, funding for our hospitals and our providers during COVID. Um, so we've done, we did a big bill um, around uh, those three areas um, and um, along with surprise billing, which is an issue that a lot of people, it's been um, very important to a lot of people. It's when you get when you go to the hospital, maybe for an emergency, and you use your provider in your hospital, and it's all in your network, and then what happens is two months later, you get a bill for $1,000 because the anesthesiologist wasn't in, um, wasn't in your network, but you didn't know it. You 
you came in in an emergency. And um, so that's something that we've been working on for a long time is around surprise billing. And uh, so we did a bill and I am now the lead Senate uh, uh, conference, uh, lead, the leads, excuse me. Uh, these, right. these, these are the kinds of things that that's, both, yeah. both participants and audiences have had to get used to, right? So yes. Yes. We'll, just, we'll just continue forward. Let me ask right. you actually in terms of continuing forward, whether if you could just tell us a little bit, or I'm curious, when you say you've been working very involved in telehealth, and that was part of this, this bill that you are uh, one of the lead sponsors on, or at least in, in terms of the, the committee that's come together, right. um, what are you doing? Uh, is that just expanding the opportunities for people to get services via, you know, r remotely? So one of the things that we did early on in the, um, in the pandemic is we pushed, uh, we actually uh, did a bill on, uh, on expanding telehealth, access to telehealth. And then the governor um, then did a, a um, an executive order that said, any inpatient, any in, in-person service can be delivered by telehealth during the pandemic, during the state of emergency, um, which was our bill. Um, and then, so what we're doing now is we wanna make sure that those opportunities and that access stays in place beyond the um, state of emergency. And so what this part of what this bill is that I am um, negotiating with the house is to um, determine how telehealth will continue beyond the beyond the pandemic, um, because it is clear that it is a key um, piece in the delivery of healthcare, and it is something that has been incredibly successful. And we need to continue to make it available. All right. So, good example, in fact, of that kind of thing, which is something I've asked you about before as well, and which we're always curious about. What kinds of things are come out out of the exigency or urgency of the pandemic that you've realized, oh, this is a good right. thing that we want to make sure we kind of instill uh, in exactly, a permanent yes. way. So. And, 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 you know, scope of practice is the same thing, allowing nurses, for example, to work to the height of their licensure, which allows them to see patients and be part of a team and, um, and you know, do diagnostics and, you um, and all of that is really important because it expands um, expands access to experienced, good providers. Um, so that's something that we want to continue is to allow that to uh, allow nurses to do, for instance, nurses um, to provide healthcare, especially really important in the behavioral health space um, to have uh, advanced psychiatric nurses um, be able to uh, treat to treat people. Um, is really important. Yeah, and again, uh, undoubtedly um, exacerbated under no, these conditions, um, right. but also necessary in a in a general way. Um, beyond this, the this work on uh, around health that you are doing, um, I just wanted to ask again: uh, Is there stuff either that you are particularly involved in, or that may be you know of of uh, particular concern or import um, to your constituents in the in the five towns that you that you represent. So one of the areas that I've been working on um, is around childcare, and the um, so it's fascinating what this uh, pandemic has um, brought to light, and. Um, there's many things and, and, and it's certainly, we've certainly seen many, what the, what the fragility of our entire system is and how connected everything is to each other. And um, one of the big issues is around childcare. Um, people talk about the getting the economy back, and, and back on track and there's lots of things that we need to do to do that. But one of the most important um, uh, aspects of it is making sure that there's adequate high quality child care because people can't go back to work if they can't ensure that their children are going to be safe and taken care of. And um, we especially now it's really exacerbated because people, kids are not going back to school and school has been traditionally, you know, 
um, the, has, right. the has biggest provided child care that. provider there is, right? Yeah, yeah. really good because they're providing education. Um, and lots of work is, is built around those hours. And now I'm hearing from constituents all over that they, and some of them are saying, I have to quit my job because I don't have any, I, I, my, my kids are at home and they're little and the economic impact of that is profound. So um, I've started, I'm, I'm now starting to work on that and trying to pull together um, a coalition of people, administration, providers, businesses, to address how we can um, provide childcare for, especially for school age children, um, while, while schools are hybrid or remote or, you know, and, you know, like so many other, so many things, you know, this is an issue for, you know, some people are very well, they're well connected. They have, you know, they've got, they're economically secure. They can figure out how to put pods together, how to share resources. It's, you know, it's, it's doable for some people, but for so many people, so many people, those, those opportunities aren't available. And, and it really is the role of government to help figure out, help put together solutions to those kinds of problems um, so that people can get back to work. Well, you are 100% right there, I think. And um, certainly it does seem like childcare is one of those stealth issues that just underlies an awful lot of things that, it, that get a lot more attention. Right. And that suddenly you take that away and it, it turns out to have been a bedrock support for a lot of other, again, oh, higher profile right. things that we're often concerned about. It is an issue, as you said, that, that just goes, spreads far and wide such that I, in my own life, it is a constant source of conversation or topic of conversation with lots and lots of people that I know. And therefore, I am aware of how, you know, we're, our minds are exploding in these conversations as we're trying to figure out what answers are there. So yeah. you said you have begun to, I, I don't know where you are in the process of, um, of gathering uh, these various uh, constituencies and, and areas of expertise to try and figure this out. Um, but are you, how hopeful are you? Are, are people able to generate ideas from what you've seen so far that that may be able in fact to address this in a way that those of us sitting around in our living rooms just haven't you know haven't been able yeah. to come up with i think that there is an enormous amount of creative thinking going on i think the issue is it's not that people aren't thinking about it it's that people are very siloed so groups are very siloed so schools look at one thing early childhood looks at another businesses look at another, you know, and they're all in silos. And so all I'm trying to do is say, can, can we stop siloing this? Because it's, it affects everybody. You can't have a solution for employees that don't include business. Schools have to be involved in how the, you know, while they're, while they are not the providers of childcare and shouldn't be, they are the educators and kids are going to school um, and so how do we all, how does this all get connected in a way that serves the kids and then, um, and serves parents who need to get to work. So my, my goal is just to, to say, hey, everybody, let's, can we, can you all sit at the same table? Because um, I think that's the only way we're going to figure this out. And there is a certain amount we can do. And then we can't do more without the help of the federal government. And this is so, this is just the truth across so much of what this state is trying to do. God, thank God I live in Massachusetts because I think we have done an extraordinary job in dealing with this pandemic. And, um, things are not, you know, things don't always run smoothly. It's not always working. Um, there are problems, but thoughtful people are at the helm 
they are doing the best they can. They are working very hard in, in the midst of something that nobody has ever done before. They are great at responding. They are great at turning the ship around when they have to. We're all learning. And I don't think, I can't, I don't think a, a state is doing it any better. So I'm really grateful for that. But, there's, but if the federal government does not get its act together, and they don't start helping states, and they don't start providing leadership, we will not get through this because we can't make these decisions alone. We are not an endless pit of resources. Um, we need continuity around certain, um, around certain issues, providing healthcare and rolling out vaccines when we have them or testing. That's all part of a federal government's responsibility and we don't have that partner. And we've got to get that in place if we're going to get out of this. Yeah, and your your encouraging words about you know what is happening here, the management of this crisis uh, in Massachusetts, and frankly here in Arlington as well. Oh, uh, um, yeah. Certainly, the numbers bear that out. Um, yeah. the, the again, with the caveat that things can change at any point. We all get that. <laughs> if we right. if we didn't get it before, we sure get it now. Um, the numbers do look uh, like 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 government action has been and and action of citizens compliance etc has been effective. Right. And um, I mean, I, and, I don't go whenever I have conversations with the administration, which is very often, um, and it's around a lot of the different um, rollout of of you know COVID kinds of um, activities. I always hear, well, you know, you're Arlington, so you got this great public health um, department. You don't have to worry about you, you know. So where our reputation, um, our public health, uh, board of health, public health is, is well, well regarded. Right, but you, you did, I, I just want to follow up a little bit on what you were just saying about the fact that there is a massive, massive role that the federal government needs to play here and you know, we we all have relatively little reason for confidence that 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 you know that that that's going to be happening anytime soon. Um, I wonder whether that also is part of the answer to the next thing I want to ask about, which is um, the desperate, the increasingly desperate need for some kind of economic development help uh, as as the um, you know, as the as the chickens come home to roost here, uh, what we had anticipated and feared from the beginning of the pandemic, when you just arrest development, so to speak, um, in the way that we've had to, um, we're now seeing the restaurants just not coming back, the shops uh, boarded up, and and again, not those doors are not going to reopen, et cetera. And the many, many people out of work who no longer are getting assistance like they were initially. What can you tell us? Uh, again, understanding that there are finite resources within the state, uh, you know, just give us an update on what is happening, uh, you know, in the state legislature to address these very, very real impacts on so many people? There are a number of things that I know about. I mean, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's a huge, it's a, it's a huge issue. And as we said before, there's so many interrelated pieces. Um, in terms of what the legislature is doing, I mean, we, we, we had a housing bill that, um, where we worked with the administration to stop um, foreclosures and evictions. We need to fix that, modify it so that small um, homeowners, landlords, small landlords are not, you know, affected adversely, which is what's happening right now. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of effort to, to address that issue. Um, the child care issue is very big and we're trying to fix that so people can get back to work. Um, our, we're looking at a budget and, and um, we're working on um, ways that we can kind of use our resources so that we're not doing massive cuts to everyone because once you start massive cutting everything then you just exacerbate the problems um so there's a lot of work going on um and that's very um 
a lot of work going on around how we can manage our budget while we're waiting and hoping that the federal government will do its job and support the states. Um, so um, we're relaxing some rules that make it harder for people to provide care. So, you know, so that it's less um, administrative and financial burdens for people to, for instance, do telehealth. Um, I believe that, um, you know, we're all sitting around waiting for a vaccine, right? Because if we really want to get back to work, we really have to make sure that we have a way of keeping people safe. And that's really what's driving this, right? So businesses are closing, people are, um, schools are shutting down. It's all around the, the virus, okay? And I really believe that what we need to be focusing on is much better different kinds of testing so that we can be more nuanced or be, uh, I'm not sure what the word is, but so that we can let people do their work and get back to their daily lives as long as they are not infectious. So one of the things about this virus is that there's so many, over 40% of the people that have it um, are asymptomatic, okay? So they don't know that they have it. Um, and that's what, one of the reasons why it makes it so dangerous because you just start, you wanna walk around, you say, I'm fine. Our tests are very, they're like hammers. You either got it or you don't have it, right? But that doesn't tell us what we need to know, which is I may have some little pieces of the virus in me, but can I give it to you, James? Do I have enough that I can that I can infect you? Well, if I can't, then I should be able to go to work. I should go to restaurants. I should, you know, my I should go to school. We need testing that tells us that. If we can be confident that the people who need to be quarantined because they are infectious, they can give it to someone else. If we can be sure, we can quarantine those people and separate them out, then the rest of us can get on with, with our work. And so I think we really need to focus on how we can better test, how we can, how we can find better tools so that we can um, uh, not be so, uh, have such a blanket reaction which is all we have right now. And so that's what we have to do. Um, you know, our tests are wonderful diagnostic tests, but they're not good public health tests. And that's what we need. So I think we really got to focus on the places that are, are trying to solve that problem because we're not going to see a vaccine or we're not going to be out of this for quite some time. And so how do we continue our lives um, while we're in the middle of this pandemic? I think that's what we need to focus on. Yeah, ex excellent points, actually. Um, let me ask you about a couple of, of issues that are um, <laughs> uh, ever present uh, in these days um, and that touch on Massachusetts and also here in Arlington. Um, one of them is uh, the idea and any advancement towards uh, police reforms. Um, and um, I'd like to ask you about, first of all, just an update on anything that's uh, emanating or potentially so from the State House uh, around this. And then I want to ask you about a very specific Arlington issue. So let's start with the State House. Well, there's, there was, there is a criminal justice bill that came out of the Senate and came out of the House, and uh, one is the Senate, one is the House. And those are the, those. There is a conference committee that's negotiating the differences in that. And I think we'll see some. Uh, we'll, we'll see some progress. I think, um, you know, certainly in the next three months. And um, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, similarities in the bills, and there were some differences. And so I think that's. I'm not party to the conference committee, and I couldn't talk about it anyway, even if I was. So I can't tell you much more than that. Um, but I know that there's, um, there's, there's certainly common ground and then there are some things that need to be worked out. 
And obviously, I think people that. are familiar with the fact that, you know, several years ago now, um, a giant omnibus uh, criminal justice reform bill got passed here in, in, in the state. And I assume that this, this work that you're talking about is either further advancing some of the things that were, were addressed there or dealing with stuff that, again, has come to seem very, very important, perhaps in the time since. Yeah, this is, it's a, it's a focus on law enforcement. Okay. Um, speaking of a focus on law enforcement, let me ask you, and I understand that here, I really, because I'm speaking to you uh, in front of your house here in Arlington, uh, I imagine that that's where you are. Um, and as an Arlington resident, um, more than as, a, as our state legislator, um, we are uh, about a, a week away or so um, from what may be uh, the last step in a process uh, that uh, a restorative justice process for Lieutenant Rick Pedrini here in town um, on the basis of writings he made a couple of years ago. Everybody, I think, is very familiar with this at this point. Um, obviously has caused a lot of consternation, conversation, controversy in town for now a couple of years, um, roiling what is usually a, a pretty... Uh, you know, again, a town in which a consensus is not hard to find most of the time, this has clearly uh, been a different story. So we may be coming to the end of this. Again, the end of the restorative justice process is an apology and acknowledgement uh, that's set for September 22nd. So as an Arlingtonian, again, um, what do you think about what you've seen um, and heard o over these last couple of years? So I really am speaking as a resident of Arlington because this is a very local issue. Um, I'm deeply disheartened by what's happened. Um, I think the, our, our ability to vilify people, to lose our humanity, um, in all of this is just, it's, it's, it's striking and it's heartbreaking and you know i listen i i understand you know i'm an elected official and i know there's lots and lots of people out there who've never met me i've never spoken to and they're sure i'm corrupt and dishonest because i'm an elected official and i understand that you know that's probably and i know that there's people that do that like against the police right you're a policeman so you're bad and you're violent right and we just can't live in a society like that we can't lose our humanity and look i, I don't care about rick Pedrini. we have such big problems to solve and so you know and so much need out there um and and real issues that people need to figure out how to live together um and the focus on whether or not some one person is going to be fired is just, it's amazing to me and it's frustrating to me. And it's, you know, and, and it, it doesn't represent what we ought to be focused on, you know? And I think the, what I find so upsetting is that there are so many good people in this town and they're being screamed at and yelled at and, um, treated badly because they're trying to help solve a problem because they're trying to figure out what, how do we live together right so you know i am i am somebody who absolutely believes in police reform i think that um we need to be sure that all of our citizens are being treated equally and um and that um, people have access to justice and fairness but this is a small town, okay? We know who these people are. We know our police. Um, we need to come together. We need to stop vilifying, um, you know, not only to stop vilifying um, people who want to try and make a difference, right? Like the Human Rights Commission, who's working incredibly hard to figure out a way to have a conversation. We need to stop vilifying them, and we need to stop vilifying our police force, right? Um, 
there's bad police, there's bad citizens, there's bad people, there's bad politicians. But we can't lose sight of our humanity and we can't lose sight of the fact that I can have a direct relationship with you. You are a person, I am a person, I'm not just a politician, I'm not just a policeman, I'm not just somebody who's trying to, you know, to run a human rights commission, right? And that's what I think has happened is that we, there's no common ground anymore, there's no middle. And frankly, James, at this point, I don't need, I don't, I don't care about Rick Pedrini, I don't care what, I mean, he should be apologizing. I think what he did is horrible. But whether Rick Pedrini stays or goes isn't going to solve the problems that we have in front of us. And I, it, it, it angers me that people are out there and all they're talking about is whether or not we fire Rick Pedrini. Like, and then what? So that is my rant as a <laughs> private citizen of the, of the town of Arlington that I love and that I have enormous respect for and a lot of people in. And um, I really think that if we can just stop yelling at each other and just kind of talk about what matters and how we feel and listen to each other, we probably can get, we can get pretty far. And um, I, I support all the people in town that are trying to, that are trying to solve the problem, not just be angry and cause the problems. And that's both sides. There's no. Right. Hey, I really appreciate uh, your candor and clearly uh, the passion um, that you feel around this. Well, I'm, I'm sure my phone will start buzzing and people <laughs> will start screaming at me. <laughs> but, you know. Uh, you know, as again, hopefully they're screaming at you as neighbors, you know, as another citizen right, or not screaming citizen. at you at right. all. Because Cause I have, I it. have no control over this in Arlington. Yeah. I mean, it's not my, it really right. is me as a, as a, as just a resident. Of course. Spe and you know, uh, while we're on the subject of things you don't have control over as a state legislator, um, let me just ask you, because I think there might it might be useful to clarify if there is any role as people wrestle in community after community with re, with school reopening, what form is it going to take? How are we going to keep it safe? How are we going to balance the competing interests? Same things happening here in Arlington as everywhere else. Um, people might think or look to the state legislature to provide uh, guidance and leadership around here or think that there's a role. I think there's not. Oh, oh, uh, please illuminate the, the uh, situation for us. Well, certainly the, um, the state has standards and requirements for delivering education. Um, how that is delivered and, um, you know, the whole air issues around school openings and um, uh, hybrid learning remote, that is really a local decision. And, you know, that's how our that's how our system is set up. I mean, every every district has its uh, teachers. They have their own contracts. Um, they make their own local decisions um, about how things are, you know, rolled out. They have requirements that they have to report, you know, et cetera, to the state. But that the, all the reopening is 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 it's a local decision, and so unless we want to change that and make you know or you know take away that. Um, the um, local control over it, and maybe there's reasons to or not. I mean, that's the discussion, a separate discussion that I don't know enough about to kind of weigh in on. This is what we got. And um, so we can recommend, the, the Department of Education can recommend certain things. They can, um, but they're not, they're, they're not, the cities and towns get to make the ultimate decision. And it's a very, 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 very difficult decision. And um, like every, like pretty much everything in this pandemic, there's no good answer. There's less bad answers and there's really bad answers, but you know, a good decision, this is really hard. And I know that town, cities and towns everywhere in my district, across the board, across the state are struggling with this. And it's just critical that there be good communication and that the communication continue. I mean, that's, you know, but I, I don't know what else 
I mean, the state can certainly provide support and um, they can have requirements, but it's really up to the cities and towns how they, or the, or the local school districts, how they are gonna handle this particular. All right, thank you. Um, as usual, I've kept you talking for quite a while here. Um, and let me just ask you before we close, uh, if there is anything either we've somehow left out, um, though it has been a wide ranging conversation, obviously, um, or that you particularly just want to highlight that's in the works, uh, going to be, you know, something that people can anticipate. Any, any Anything that fits into that broad category of a, we should say something about this before we sign off. Well, I, I, I do want to say that I think the state's been great in the um, legislature and the administration. You know, we, we have kept um, the local, um, uh, um, local contributions local. and Chapter 70 We've kept them, we've not cut them, and we've sort of given it a slight um, uh, inflation increase. And so I think that's a great thing for a, a real relief for um, our communities and um, certainly something that I support. I think there's a lot of work being done to ensure that um, we use our resources so that we're not cutting um, really vital programs. And um, I'm the vice chair of, um, this of Senate Ways and Means, so I know that that work's going on, and I, I am hopeful, at least for FY21, that we can figure out how to, um, you know, creatively use our, our resources so that we're not cutting and that we're not necessarily affecting our rainy day fund. So I think that's um, uh, that's a good effort. Um, I know. Can I ask you, Cindy? Sorry for the interruption, but I, I realized that I meant to ask you something about this before. You mentioned the rainy day fund, and you mentioned that it is so that it is not affected too much. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure. I, I, I think we would all agree that it's a rainy day. we haven't faced a crisis like this. <laughs> like, if this is not a rainy day, rainy what day, is? Right, 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 right. So, so right. what do you mean by that? Like, what is the approach with that pot of money? Um. um. It's, it, it, there's really competing interests, right? I mean, one is you have a rainy day, though this is the way I look at it. One is that you have a rainy day fund because you have a rainy day and you need to use it. But then there's this other separate world of um, bonding and, um, and insurance, et cetera, that sort of looks and says, do you have a rainy day fund, right? And how big is it? And if it's big enough, then we we rate you a certain way. And those are really compete to me. That's kind of competing, right? Um, because at some point they ought to give you credit for having had the rainy day fund, so that you can actually keep your economy going. And you but, have to imagine they would also have to change their metrics in the face of yeah. what we're all dealing with. But anyway. But this is way, 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 way beyond my pay grade. So, but I what I do think is going on and is important is you really don't, you really want to keep that whole as much as you can. Because, uh, I mean, I think people feel like in our state, for instance, you know, we probably, you know, we do have some federal government money, we do have some, um, some pots of, of resources that we might be able to, to use or utilize or move around. And if we can do that, we really don't want to touch the savings. Um, and so I think that's what they're trying to do. But we have really, not yet reached that point. And if you haven't reached all the rest of that. Right. You want to make sure that you haven't reached that point. So probably we won't be able to contribute to the rainy day fund in 21. But the question is, can we keep it whole and still keep these really essential programs in, you know, um, funded? And so I think that's what that's what happens is that you just try everything you can before you just dip into that because then when that's done it then you're really out of resources so right you want to so put it off as long as you can one lesson here then uh is that whether it's chapter 70 whether it's local aid whether it's the rainy day fund the fact that we are holding our ground uh yeah. in this state is an accomplishment it is an accomplishment it is something at this point. that takes yeah. you know real effort and that we need to kind of celebrate and recognize right uh, or at least uh, Breathe a bit of a, a small sigh of relief, mm -hmm. you know. 
Fair enough. And you might be breathing a small sigh of relief that I don't have any more questions yes, uh, at this point for you. Um, thank you again for, for taking the time today. Appreciate, uh, you know, the information as always, for sure. Um, but also, as I recognized earlier, uh, the candor and the forthrightness <clears throat> with which you speak to me and to us. Um, I think that uh, I hope that people appreciate that that is not business as usual or what anybody can expect necessarily from their elected politicians all the time. Um, and, uh, and I do think that the audience appreciates it. So on their behalf and on my own, thanks for that. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, I'll just forward all the calls I get to you. <laughs> <laughs> you wish. Uh, all right. All right. <laughs> Cindy, we will talk to you uh, sometime in this fall into winter and we wish you the very best. Okay. Take care, James. Thank you. I've been talking to our state Senator, Cindy Friedman and Arlington resident, proud and, uh, and long time. Um, I'm James Milan. This has been a legislative update as part of Talk of the Town. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.